Thank you, everybody, for uh, coming today. We are very excited about the uh, presentation. And I'm delighted to welcome my, my friend and uh, former student, uh, Miguel Kigel, from Argentina. Uh, let me just say a few words about him. He uh, graduated from, from Colombia. I don't know if he allows me to say this, but 30 years ago. <laughs> and look how young he is. <laughs> so we, you know, there's a lot of hope for you guys. <laughs> and uh, so I'm delighted to welcome him back. Uh, he's uh, presently uh, working very actively on, uh, in, in connection with this uh, organization, Econ Views, that advises uh, locally and also internationally on Argentina and, and other issues. And, um, you know, Miguel is, a, is, is precisely the person you want to have to have a good discussion of these issues because he knows exactly what, uh, what's cooking up there. He's been in the kitchen. He's been, for example, under Secretary of Finance and Chief Advisor to the Minister of Economic economy of Argentina in 1996, 1999, uh, and uh, so he knows what he's talking about. And uh, in addition, he has a very strong uh, academic background. He has several books and uh, has written on macroeconomics uh, and published in, in, uh, in, uh, in good places. So it's a combination of an academic and somebody who has a good sense of, of policy. This is precisely the combination that I think is extremely useful given the issues that we are facing today. Well, I don't want to spend any more of our time on this introduction. I'm delighted, really. Let me say it again to have uh, Miguel with us. And Miguel, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. It's really a pleasure to be here, uh, especially because I'm, I have the honor to have two of my thesis advisors of my dissertation, Guillermo Calvo and Ron Findlay. So, but today I don't have to give you an exam, so <laughs> makes life easier. That's what you think. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what I'll try to do in this hour, and then we will open the floor for questions, is to try to explain the unexplainable. A very complex situation about the debt, lots of uh, confusion about what goes on. Um, so I would try to give you a sense of when it all started, uh, how, how did it evolve. And, and as you know, today Argentina is um, again in default, in a very complicated situation because everyone says that Argentina is in default except the Argentine government. So it's very difficult to explain and to summarize what goes on. There are a lot of, if you listen to the Ministry of Finance, he would say, how can we, how, how can we be in default if we, if, we, if we paid? Then you talk to the creditors and said they paid, but we didn't receive the money. So it's really a mess, okay? So we will try to, to, to at least discuss the issues and, and try to put things where, where they are. So how did it all start? I decided to put kind of a chronology of this saga to, in order to, to try to make, to put things more or less in context. Argentina had defaulted in 2001. That, at that time was the largest default in history, $82 billion, okay? We're competing still with Greece, or well, Greece didn't default either, so we, know, we don't know, so it's another mess, but basically, Argentina uh, had a very large default and a very complex default. Why? Because it's, uh, there were bonds issued under a number of juridic jurisdictions. There were bonds I issued under New York law, there were bonds issued under uh, London law, under Frankfurt law, and, and, under Japan, uh, under, in Japan and in Argentina. So it's really very messy. So it was when people thought Argentina is going to enter into default, everyone knew that it was going to be a mess, and it was a mess. Uh, there was the first offer that Argentina made 
in 2004 to the bondholders, I think it was the Doha offer. Um, and at that time, uh, what, what the, the, if you value the, the, the offer that was before the rally in emerging markets, the debt was worth, the, the offer, when you put all the numbers and discount at the right prices, was worth roughly 20 cents. Okay? So basically, it was the, not only was the largest debt in history, or the fault in history, it was also the largest haircut in history, probably. But, and Argentina never changed the offer, but what happened is there was a rally in emerging markets, uh, interest rates for emerging markets dropped, and the same offer with the same cash flows, the same money, was worth close to 33 cents to the dollar. And that's what Argentina offered, and that's what eventually became the offer that was in, at last accepted. Uh, in the first offer, participation was roughly 76% of the bondholders, which probably at that time one would consider low. Uh, a typical restructuring, you get participations north of 90%. And in a successful one, you get closer to 97 or 98%. So this one was not a very good high participation, but in the end was, at least we got out of it, a large 76% of the bondholders accepted, and, uh, and there were basically three bonds were issued. One was a par bond, uh, which basically implied no nominal haircut. Obviously, in, in terms of market values, the bonds were still worth 33 cents. But uh, there was a discount bond, which traded at par. And there was another bond, which was the Global 17, which was issued for uh, the past due interest. So there were basically three bonds. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about whether the, that offer was a good offer. Probably wasn't, was a very tough offer. It was surprising that so many people accepted. And I think that a lot of people accepted the offer because they saw that there was no, there was no uh, in another way, there was no way to get the money otherwise, which that's changed the view recently. But at that time, says so basically stake it or leave it. If you don't get this offer, you might not be able to see money until. 2015, 16, somewhere in there, and but you no, know, put in 2005. That what meant a long, long time. So I think that that's one of the reasons that that people accepted the offer. The other, the, what was probably interesting in the offer was that Argentina also included a new instrument, which was the GDP warrant. Uh, that was a coupon, basically. A warrant is a, is an open, is, is an instrument that uh, was a way to say basically whose value increases with, with GDP. In other words, what, what, the, what the warrant said is that was that if Argentina grew more than a certain number, let's say 3%, Argentina would share with the bondholders the excess GDP. In other words, whatever you grow more than 3%. That was kind of a new instrument, was never used in any restructuring before. It's more, this is an instrument that's used more in corporate restructuring, restructurings, not so much in sovereign restructurings, and was very kind of controversial. Why was it controversial? Because it was designed in a very weird way. It was, in a way, if Argentina was very, very successful, which in a way it was during a number of years, the creditors would get a lot of money. But at the same time, at the time, of the offer, the creators basically put no value on this instrument. So basically, you gave, you gave them an option for which they, they didn't value, they, didn't, they think was worthless, and ended up Argentina costing a lot of money. That's kind of an anecdote. So that's why it's so difficult to, to evaluate Argentina's offer. Uh, clearly, I mean, looking from today's perspective, for Argentina, it would have been much, much better to offer more money with bonds and cash than to provide this, uh, this warrant. Um, but not, probably that's easy to say now. But anyway, that was the offer, was accessible. 76% of the people accepted the offer. And then there was a second offer in 2010, what's called the reopening. And in, with the reopening, you basically managed to get 93% of the bondholders to exchange their bonds. So only 7% remained as what we call the holdouts. That's, that's it, people who were, did not accept the offer, either because they didn't know they had the bonds or something, they were 
somewhere else thinking about something else. There, there are many cases of that. You would be surprised, but this, this, these cases exist. It's like almost 1%. And the rest were the holdouts, which you know some friends of mine call them vultures. Others come with all different names, depending how much you hate them. Okay. <laughs> so that's basically the, the situation. Um, and uh, I, I would say 2010 was the last offer that Argentina made. Now, things were going until 2012, things were going relatively well for Argentina. I mean, Argentina, what was the debt situation? Argentina had restructured 93% of the debt. There were lots of lawsuits in New York, and their judge, I don't know how you pronounce it in English, like Grise or Griesa, depending how you, how you pronounce it. So there were lots of, of, of lawsuits. And until 2012, all the efforts by the holdouts to make attachments on Argentina had failed. They tried to attach accounts. Uh, they tried to block funds for the embassies. Uh, most recently, they, they attached uh, a boat in Ghana. All those things they tried. In the end, the judge always ruled for Argentina. So for 10 years, in a way, the judge sided with Argentina. Okay? Uh, at, at least in terms that there was this, the, 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 the holders didn't get anything. They tried everything that you can imagine. They, they, ha they have ex very, very expensive lawyers, very clever, not only expensive, but good lawyers. Not, they don't always go together. Um, and, uh, and what happened is that you got the, this, this situation in which Argentina basically felt that it could live with murder forever. Okay, that, that was the feeling of the government, that really, if you ask our, the Argentine government what was the cost of staying in default until this case, and, until recently, very small. Argentina, the only real restriction was that Argentina couldn't uh, access the international financial markets. It could not issue a bond in New York, in New York or in Europe because there would, there would be an attachment. But otherwise, Argentina issued dollar bonds in Argentina, uh, they had trade, could go basically everywhere, and there were, I mean, Argentina generated the technology, financial technology that allowed it to live with default. Now, what has changed? February last year, there was a rule of 2012, there was a ruling that basically everyone ignored, which was called the Pari, what's, what today everyone knows as the Pari Pasu ruling. Uh, which, in a, in a sense, it says that you have to treat all creditors equal. So if you pay some creditors, you, if you have to pay some, you have to pay all of them. You cannot, you cannot ignore the debt. Um, now, no one really pay attention to that until in, I think, was... Um, that means they have to pay what they pay the other people? Or it wasn't clear. No, no, they had to pay. They, they had to pay. Well, Argent, it doesn't say ex the pari pasu is, up, is subject to interpretation, and and the way this judge interpreted pari pasu is one of the controversial issues. Okay, but in principle, what it says is there was something written in the old bonds that you cannot ignore the debt. Uh, Argentina did one big mistake that really helped build the case of the creditors. When it did the exchanges, it, be, it passed a law in Congress called the Lock Law, Ley Candado. What that said was that Argentina, for, you know, that was kind of in order to induce people to get into the exchange, they said, if you don't get into the exchange, you won't get anything, ever. Okay? So that was kind of the way to say, come or forget it. Uh, and that law, in a way, basically repudiated the old bonds. It means full repudiation. If you interpret it, it's, it, it's almost like repudiating the old bonds, the bonds that, of the, that were issued previously. So we, once the, with the lock law, basically gave the arguments to the holdouts 
that say, listen, you can, you can, and the other thing is they, they said they were not going to repay and they, 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 they basically closed the possibility of, 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 of getting even the same offer that everyone got. So the big mistake that Argentina made was basically closing this exchange, not keeping it open for people to come. So these guys go to the judge um, and, uh, and they go to the judge and they said, tell the judge, listen, these guys, the, the Argentines, the Argentine government, is saying that my debt doesn't exist, it's nowhere, and I will never be paid. And that really opened the, the, the issue of equal treatment among creditors. Equal treatment doesn't mean that everyone gets the same, but it means that you have to at least cannot ignore the old creditors. You cannot pay some creditors and say the others, no, forget it. You will never get paid a penny, and it's in the law. Because I think that was kind of the weakness. Anyway, uh, then uh, the, there were a number of things that Argentina did. Um, and uh, in the, the crucial day was in, I think was October of 2012, when the appeals court, the, the, the New York Courts of Appeal, the uh, second circuit of the second Courts of Appeal, uh, said, basically upheld Greece's ruling that Argentina had to pay in full the, to the holdouts. Um, he asked two questions to the judge at that time. Says, okay, your, 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 your ruling is right, but we need two clarifications. The first clarification was that the judge said that they have to pay pro rata between the original, the, the exchange bond holders, the new ones, and the old bond holders. So he wanted some clarification of how they would be paid. And second, he wanted some assurances that there would not be an impact on the financial sector, on the payment mechanism, uh, which I'm, at the moment there are some questions whether there is some, some, some issues there. On the pro rata thing, which is how do we, when Argentina sends a dollar to the US, how is it divided between the old bondholders and the new bondholders, he says the debt at the moment is the old bondholders, the holdouts, are, are entitled to get the full amount. The new, the, the exchange bondholders are entitled to get only the interest coupon. At, at the, let's say Argentina sends $100 to, uh, to make the payment. How do you divide? He says, the, I take the, the whole amount that Argentina has to pay at that time, which is to the holdouts, the whole amount and to the bondholders and to the, and to the exchange, only the, the interest coupon. So in, in effect, it meant that the, the exchange bondholders were not going to get almost any money. Most of the money that Argentina were to send to the US was going to go to the, um, to the holdouts. Um, so with that two things, uh, basically, the idea was that if Argentina were to send money, to, to, to the US, um, all the money basically will go to the holdouts and, Argent and, the, and the bondholders would not get paid with a coupon and that what would trigger a default. Because if, if the bondholders are not, the, new, the exchange bondholders, the new bondholders, do not get in full all the interest payments that they're entitled to get, that triggers a default. And that's in a way is what happened. Um, so now we are at the moment uh, in which uh, the bond hold, let me just, one second. So where, where are we now? Basically, let me see, this is, this is some time, part of the timeline. Um, our first, Argentina decided to appeal to the, to the Supreme Court. Argentina did appeal the ruling to the Supreme Court with the idea of trying to get time, to, to kind of buy time to get to the end of the, of the year and see whether you could get a different re re resolution. So that's, what did the Supreme Court say? The Supreme Court said, I'm not taking your case. Once the Supreme Court said, I'm not taking your play case, Grisas or Grisas ruling was firm, 
there was no way to appeal, and Argentina had to make a decision. Decision at that point. There were only two options. One was Argentina sends the money to the U.S., in which case uh, there would be a default, because if it only sorry, if he only sends the coupon payment, which was due June 30th, which was roughly six, seven, five hundred million dollars. If he said that, that five hundred million dollars, the bondholders of the discount, which is one of the bonds, would not get the money because most of the money would go to the holdout, and in that case there would be a default. Alternative number two was sending the money for the for the bondholders and for the holdouts, in which case the holdouts would get all the money, and Argentina didn't want to do that. And, and the alter third alternative was sending zero, in which case the holdouts wouldn't be paid, and Argentina would be in default. What did Argentina do? None of the above. <laughs> Basically, they, they decided to pay in Argentina but the money was not transferred to the US, to the US. So the money is still in Argentina, in an escrow account in the central bank. In the second payment, they, they changed the trustee, which is some complication over there. And at the moment, uh, Argentina hasn't paid, hasn't been able to pay to the bondholders, uh, to the discounts of the exchange bondholders, and hasn't paid the holdout. So, if, if the bondholders don't get the money in time, that means the country is in default because with the, the bondholders didn't get the money. Argentina says we paid because they put the money in this escrow account, and he it says it's, it's the judge that doesn't allow us to pay. We pay. So come to Argentina and get the money. No, serious. <laughs> this is what they're saying. Say, so come to Argentina and get the money. And they pass a law in which they offer the bondholders to exchange bonds or to get paid in Argentina, but no one wants to come. Okay? The fact is people prefer a defaulted bond in the US than a current bond in Argentina. Okay? That's more or less where the story lies today. Um, let me see what, what comes later. Um, let me give you a few figures and then we'll go a little more back and forth on these issues. Uh, the holdouts, um, no one knows exactly. I mean, the original debt was around $81.8 billion. Um, so, but basically, the holdouts the, in, in the original value was roughly $6.6 .6 billion. Then they're over, over, past your interest. You know, this was as of 2005, so the figure today is much larger. We try to estimate how big is the figure relative to total Argentina's debt. Total net public debt of Argentina is roughly $1.2 billion, sorry, $102 billion, which represents around 21% of GDP. Okay? So, any, if you do any solvency test of Argentina, if, if you look at Argentina from a debt to GDP ratio, Argentina would be solvent. So Argentina doesn't have, have a debt problem in a way. Uh, one of the abilities of the government, of this government, was to make a problem where there was none, but it managed to do it. Um, and the holdouts represents today roughly between 13 and 15 billion dollars. That's the number we are talking about. That's approximately three percent of GDP. Um, so if you look just at the financial uh, advantages or disadvantages of solving this issue. In principle, uh, I would say if, if you were just an analyzing from a financial point of view, you would try to solve it. Because it's true, it costs you money, uh, but you know, if you just put $15 billion and you put it with bonds long term, you get all this problem behind you and the economy starts to function well. Okay, because there's also a big impact, we, was, we will discuss this situation having big implications for, for the economy. So this is just to put in perspective the size of, of, this, uh, of, the, of, of, the, um, of the problem. Um, this is the amount of the holdouts. Um, of the holdouts, roughly 61% are New York legislation, 37% are um, under European legislation. Uh, okay, this gives you a little bit more idea. 
uh, and it's important one uh, one this is important for what I'm going to come next just to keep this figure in mind of the exchange bonds which are roughly 36 billion dollars 14 billion dollars are par bonds uh, the rest are discounts and, and other type of ones. Keep in mind this figure because when we come to some of the risk moving forward, which one of the risk is that this default leads to a new, a new restructuring of the debt, uh, the risk comes from, this, from these guys. Okay? So we'll, we'll come and then come back. Where, the, where the, do we stand now? Just to, to summarize, Argentina is in default but the government has paid, according to the government says it has paid, uh, the, all the bonds are in gross default. There's one clause um, that, that's important to keep in mind too, which is called RUFO. I don't know if you heard RUFO. RUFO is a clause that's it's called rights upon future offers. When Argentina made the original offer, um, it included a clause which is not in every restructuring, by the way, which is the RUFO clause. What was it saying? Basically, what it tried to do is to provide comfort to the creditors that were coming into the exchange. It said, if you come into the exchange in Argentina, I promise you that I'm not going to give, offer other creditors better terms. So basically, you, you, you in a way felt reassured that if we're taking a tough offer, if Argentina in the future were to make another offer, you would be able to participate. Question. What's the difference between that and the Pari Pasu? The Pari Pasu, in a way, compares old creditors and new creditors. The exchange bonds, the holdings, and the holdouts. The, the, basically, the Pari Pasu said if you pay one guy, you have to pay the other. But it doesn't say you have to pay the same. The Paribasu says you have to treat all creditors equal. This is a different thing. It says, I treat you, you make you the offer. If I offer another guy better terms in the future for 10 years, I will offer them to you too. Um, so it's not exactly this. It's, they're similar. The thing is that this clause, when does it expire? At the end of this year, December 2014. And what was the concern of the government? The con we will see why this, this clause is important in a minute, too. Um, now, let me see one thing and then come back. Let me just, again, key words and then I go to the different scenarios. Some of the issues to keep in mind. One is this log law that I mentioned. What the lock law said was that, uh, remember that if you, Argentina basically blocked the possibility to pay others. The pari passu that, um, that I mentioned that Guillermo is that uh, equal treatment among creditors. Equal treatment doesn't mean that everyone gets the same payment. It means that everyone is treated in, in some kind of uh, reasonable way. Okay, it doesn't mean equal payment. It means you have to treat, if you pay one, you have to pay the other. It doesn't mean that you have to pay the same amount. The third issue is RUFO that I mentioned. And the fourth, which is important, is collective act action clauses. Hmm? Uh, what's, uh, what the collective action clauses say? The collective action clauses is, is a new rule that the, that the new bonds have and the old bonds didn't have. I'm trying to put all this to because it's a complex issue, but uh, I think it's important to have all, all the elements in place. So the, the collective action clause is what it says is that when you restructure a bond uh, in, in a private bankruptcy, if you get 66, per, I don't know if that's the exact number, but roughly 66% of the creditors to accept the offer, that's enforced to the rest. Okay? Bonds issued under New York legislation typically didn't have the collective action clauses. The, old one, but the, new ones. the new ones, the old ones. The old ones basically said that if Argentina were bonds that were issued in the 90s and all the countries in the 2000s, at the beginning, what they said was that 1% of one bondholder 
even if you restructure 99.9% of, of the bonds, the other 0.1 has the right to get all the money. And that's, in a way, what the holdouts are trying to get, these vultures. Okay? With the new bonds, it's different. With the new bonds, we're issued what's called collective action clauses. Why? Because that's, that means it's easy to easier to restructure. Okay? So part of the problems of the old bonds was that only under New York law, not under European law, the, the problem of the old bonds was that they didn't have these collective action clauses. Oh, there's one more thing that I want to clarify, and then I'll get to the scenarios. There's another issue which, which is uh, important, is the issue of acceleration. Have you heard of acceleration of a bond? A bond might be in default, but a default doesn't mean necessarily that it's going to be a restructuring. Okay? If, if, let's say, if, if Argentina keeps not paying until the end of next year, then you get a new government. The, the government, the bonds are still in default, but no one has asked for the acceleration. Then basically, how do you clear the bankruptcy or the, or the default? Basically, by paying all the overdue interest. So you, put, you pay the interest of the, all these years that you haven't paid, and all of a sudden, your bonds are OK. What's the risk to that scenario? that there is an acceleration. An acceleration basically means someone asking for a restructuring. The restructuring of the bonds doesn't happen automatically. Someone has to ask them. And you need 25% of the bondholders of a series of a bond in order to get the restructuring. If, no, if, if that doesn't happen, then uh, the bonds can be cured. So an acceleration of a bond complicates getting out of the fault. Because if Argentina gets to the end of next year simply not paying and no one asks kind of for chapter 11 or what, uh, no one requests that, then Argentina can get out of the fault relatively easy. If, uh, if someone requests a, a restructure, uh, accelerates the bonds, which is requested a restructuring, then the next government or whoever is in charge of, of, of getting out of this is going to be complicated because they need to. Um, to restructure the bonds. It's not simply repaying. They have to get the creditors, negotiate, and try to deal a rich to get out of the fault again. So now let me go to what I see as the possible scenarios today. OK. What are the possible scenarios? So let's go back where we are. Basically, Argentina is in default, hasn't paid. No one has asked for acceleration. And so what can happen from now on onwards? What, what, what are the scenarios? The first scenario is what we call limbo. Everything stays today the same as we are today. Okay, so you start, you go for next year, you got got back and forth, back and forth claims, you go to the judge, you, you have hearings here and there, but no one basically you get with the bond situation exactly as we are today. As I and as I said, in that scenario you get a new government or this government wants to cure the situation, get out of the fault, all it has to do is simply pay the overdue interest, and it's out. What's the second scenario? Second scenario is that some guys accelerate the bond. What happens next? And the ones who have, who, first of all, is there an incentive to accelerate the bonds? The answer is, if you are a holder of a discount bond, which is worth around $82, $83, uh, probably the answer is no. Because getting into a restructuring negotiation is going to be messy, it's going to take time. You may put all your bets that at some point the situation is going to be solved with the holdouts and you get paid all your overdue coupons and the bonds are going to go through the roof. Who are the ones who have an interest or could have an interest in accelerating? Those are the holders of the parts. Remember those $14 billion that I mentioned. Those $14 billion, why do they have an incentive to accelerate? Because they have bonds that are worth 50 cents on the dollar. So they have like, in a restructure, instead of going from 83 to 100, they can go from 50 to 100. Because if the bonds are accelerated, what they are 
basically they have a claim for 100 today. Acceleration means that you have to pay me all the debt today. So there is an incentive for them for an, an acceleration of the bonds. Uh, true, they might get into a nasty negotiation. True, there are going to be legal battles. They're going to say, we want the money. Argentina is going to say, we paid. How can we accelerate the bonds? There's going to be a lot of things. And Rufo expires at the end of the year, which is the excuse that Argentina is giving not to negotiate with the holdouts. But I think if you ask me what's the big risk that Argentina has today in, in this situation, it is the issue of acceleration. Last week were the meetings in, in Washington about with the World Bank and the IMF, where a lot of investors and bankers go to Washington. And the, the big question there was, is anyone going to accelerate? There was at one of the banks, they had like a, a poll, uh, electronic poll, trying to say what investors were feeling, and it was 50-50. <laughs> Very close. Um, we don't know, honestly, uh, but this is clearly the biggest risk. What's the third option that I can imagine? The third option is that the situation gets, that you know, the default, and as we'll see in a minute, is hurting a lot the Argentine economy. Argentina's reserves are very low. Argentina's economy, we're in an economic recession. Uh, it's a mess, okay? However, there's, there are no good news. Inflation 40%, recession, no reserves. There's a parallel market where the premium is close to 80% relative to the official exchange rate. You don't want to be there, yeah? <laughs> now, in that situation, we have, you know you have elections next year. And that's where the politics come in. There are elections. Uh, Cristina doesn't run, but, and she doesn't have a successor. Some people think about her, her son. Forget it. it uh, <laughs> he's playing the PlayStation, right? <laughs> um, so he's not going to be there. Uh, and, and the new, so the new government, uh, so what happens is, but still she wants to have some influence in the elections. And she wants to leave government with an economy that's growing and generating employment. And in this situation, with the way the economy is moving, she's not going to get there. So there is some chance that in the first quarter of next year, sometime, they realize that with the elections coming, with the economic situation very complicated, they might decide to, uh, to address this issue and pay the holdouts. As I said, the amount is roughly $1.5 billion. Okay. One and a half is for this holdout, for the vulture funds. For the, for the, because there is one case which is one and a half billion dollars, the total amount is 15. But that would, that, that will be have to pay at some point or another. The one that they don't want to pay, and they see it kind of a, kind of a dogmatic or a crusade against the vulture fund is this one and a half billion dollars. The rest, they're willing to negotiate and pay. Okay, no, so this is where we are on the debt. Let me just give you a few flavor of what goes on in the economy uh, in order to know what, what the situation is and why also th this debt situation gets complicated in an economy that's doing very, very poorly. Well, what's the main problem that Argentina has today? International reserves, okay? There used to be, um, when I was, not before I came to Colombia, when I was a student in Argentina, yeah, the, the, you, 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 the, you, we used to study, study the two-gap model. I don't know if people study that anymore. Probably not. <laughs> Probably people who, at that time, people were looking, you know, there was an external constraint and an, uh, and an internal constraint. The external constraint came from lack of international reserves. I said, no, that's, that you don't, doesn't make any sense to study because you get money from the capital markets, you get money from, from a lot of places. It happens that Argentina went back to the 70s, okay? And we are again in this two-gap model. So Argentina doesn't have reserves because there's, there's no reserves, we cannot import, and the lack of imports is, is restricting economic activity. Okay, Th that's a fact. I mean, if you want to import in Argentina, you can't. Okay, simply, uh, you don't get permissions, you're not allowed to, to send the money abroad, lots of things. What can be done about that? I guess, you know, one of the things that can help that besides the evaluation is getting uh, external credit. And while Argentina is in default, we are not going to get that. 
The other problem Argentina has is recession and unemployment. I mean, we have many problems. These are the main ones. Okay. The main, the main ones that we have is recession and unemployment. What can be done? Typically, if I had my friends from the Keynesian groups, they will tell you expand monetary policy and fiscal policy. Uh, that's kind of the recipe. That's how the US is getting out of recession, Europe, and all the other guys. And it makes sense. Why not use those? We cannot use them because we already overused them in the past. OK? First, fiscal stimulus. The deficit is 5% of GDP. How much bigger it can get when you don't have any credit? The only guy who financed the, Argentina, the government of Argentina is the central bank. And that's already costing inflation of more than 40%. So I don't see much room for, for fiscal expansion. Okay? The other is monetary policy. We're already printing quite a lot. <laughs> Interest rates are extremely low. Okay? Interest rates are roughly 20%, uh, look high, right? But when inflation is 40, they look low. Okay? <laughs> So basically what you have is an economy where you, there's not much room to stimulate through, through fiscal uh, or monetary stimulus. What can you do? Basically the only thing you can get the economy moving is by getting money from abroad. And that's why Argentina desperately needs credit. And needs, in a way, the only way for Argentina to get back to growth is to solve the holdout is issue. Or at least get, and, and that in a way is where Argentina, this is the president's dilemma. She doesn't want to solve, because, solve the issue because she sees it as capitulating to the vultures. It would be a political loss. On the other hand, staying the way we are, it means a horrible domestic economy and no way to access to credit. So that's, that's why I think at some point she will have to decide and bite the bullet or whatever it is and, 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 take, uh, and basically solve it. Okay, we, we, this is some of the issues we have, and I'm not going to go. Just to show you the importance of the issue of reserves in Argentina today, this is the drop of Argentine reserves. This is even before the holdout issue. This is just poor policies. Okay? Argentina said in, this, in, in November 2011, we are losing reserves, we need to do something. What did they think? Okay, we put controls. If we control, we, we decide who we sell the currency to, we're going to be able to keep the reserves. What happened afterwards? Reserves just went one way and it's down, 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 down. Okay? So, in, so the policy of what the people some call CEPO or foreign exchange controls basically backfired. That was kind of the beginning of the end. Uh, the the, 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 the um, currencies have been going down, the, the reserves, reserves came down. Today they're roughly. 27 billion dollars, which is a low figure for Argentina. Uh, when they went up in January, when, after the devaluation, but now the, there was inflation and the, the, the basically the, the devaluation, the inflation eroded the devaluation, and where we back, we are back in January and reserves going down. Now with these levels of reserves, Argentina, as I said, can import, and 80 percent of Argentina's imports are raw materials and intermediate goods, which means that what we are seeing is production slowing down. Why is slowing down? Because simply we don't have reserves. The, the, the scarcity of reserves, uh, typically when a country doesn't have reserves, they have to de depreciate the currency. Okay? Argentina doesn't want to depreciate the currency. Government officials say we are not going to devalue, we are not going to depreciate the currency. Uh, and this is the, this orange line. But the, this lack of depreciation in, in, in the, with the perception that the currency needs to be depreciated and with a lot of money supply being printed, what did it lead to? A parallel market. So now we have an official rate which is roughly 850 and a parallel rate which is 15. We are better than Venezuela, we're 6 to 100. <laughs> There's always someone that's worse than you are. <laughs> but the problem is that with this spread, Exporters are not selling at the official. You know, there, there's a lot of. Uh, I mean, one of the one of the papers I wrote of my, my dissertation was on dual exchange rates. Guillermo remembers probably. <laughs> uh, and then, and there were a lot of things that you could see that these these systems are not sustainable for a long time because there are leakages and, and other stuff going on. Um, 
let me just, in this environment you have an inflation going up. Inflation this year is 40% uh, and probably, uh, although the official numbers again unfortunately don't, don't show the, the numbers but they are, the fiscal deficit is 5% of GDP and this is the third year in which the economy is not growing very fast. Actually this year we have a recession and the outlook is that we have a recession next year. So before I get to the implications and, and some issues for discussion, let me just make a brief reflection of what Argentina is based on where we are now. The first thing is the holds out, the holds out issue is not a minor issue. It's an issue politically and it's an issue financially and it's an issue from an economic perspective. From the econo pure, pure economic point of view, Argentina cannot get out of this um, stagflation, if you want to call it trap, unless it solves the, the holds out issue. Why? Because Argentina has a current account deficit and the only way it can build reserves is by getting capital inflows. And it's not going to get capital inflows unless it somehow generates confidence abroad and you get the, the money coming, issue bonds or somehow. And today, given that Argentina is in default, at least for most of the world, money is not coming. The cost of financing is high. It's not huge. I mean, it could have been worse, but it's, it's, it's high. Argent and our typical Argentine bond probably yields today 12, 13%, when a similar Brazilian bond yields 3%. three um, So at those rates, Argentina cannot get financing. And without the, the financing, Argentina will remain in this kind of poor equilibrium trap, where you have low investment, low growth, unemployment going up, and the issue is how, how much will the political system be able to manage that. There is one hope, at least for many, is that this RUFO clause that I mentioned expires in January. The RUFO, as I said, was this, uh, this clause the, the, that says uh, write upon future offers, that if you make a better offer, you have to extend it to all creditors. The thing is, probably the RUFO wasn't really binding because the RUFO talks about voluntary offers to purchase or exchange. It doesn't talk about judicial orders to pay. Okay. But the government made this whole thing, invention about the RUFO was a big risk for Argentina. So we have to take it that they will, they will not want to take that risk. Now this risk disappears January 1st. Some people are thinking that after January 1st, there is an opportunity that Argentina could address the holdout issue. Probably they have to have, need some window dressing that, as, they, as, as they've been saying, that in fact they haven't paid, but they paid. Okay, they have to find some kind of window dressing to save face politically. But that, that's doable always. So, so people are betting that after January, once the roof expires and the risk of having to pay a lot of people a lot of money disappears, then Argentina will settle with the holdouts and we say if we settle with the holdouts, the whole situation could be reversed. That's, uh, that's one of the bets, but you know, this, this uh, is difficult to read what's going to happen. So that's kind of the, the scenario people are, are thinking about and are betting that it might happen. Now let me just think a little bit, raise some issues which are interesting or just to, to reflect. Um, why, first of all, does this imply a change in the way restructurings will take place. The, actually, when, when you listen to what the, the arguments before the, the rulings in the judges, time and again then said Argentina is a very special case. And what they say is a very special case 
is because Argentina was in default for more than 10 years, or 15, 12 years at that time, and never made an offer to these guys. They're not, in a way, kind of, uh, they say there are not many countries that behave that way. There are very, very few countries that behave. Most countries kind of look at, uh, at ways to solving. Most countries don't repudiate the debt by passing a lock law. So I think that, in a way, doesn't mean that other restructurings are going to be treated exactly like Argentina's restructuring. Second issue is there was one concern, even in many in academia, that you know if Argentina defaults and there's going to be this mess, uh, all emerging markets are going to suffer. In fact, the only one that suffered recently is Wall Street, and had nothing to do with Argentina. Okay. Uh, I think that when you look at the contagion effect, whether you see some impact from Argentina's default on other bond markets, you don't see any. Maybe it's frustrating for us, but that, that's really what you see. Because people say it's, it's, those, it's those crazy Argentinians and that crazy president, right? Yeah, that's, that, that's not how, it has nothing to do. Also, most of new bonds are already issued with collective action clauses, which means that we're restructuring it's going to should be easier in the future. Uh, so I think that that idea that Argentina uh, was going to have a big impact, on, it's not happening. How about the idea that people would prefer London to New York? Because... Probably. I mean, I think that the big difference was the collective action clauses. Um, there are a number of. Uh, since you asked this question about London versus New York, there are a number of issues that, in my view, the, the judge has gone far beyond where should have gone. Uh, I, I mentioned the issue of the pro, ra pro rata, the way they, they, if the Argentina pays, how you distribute between the old creditors and the new creditors. In my view, that's uh, an extreme interpretation of, the, of, of Pari Paso. Probably it should have been more even between the old bondholders and the new bondholders. Okay? But that's, that's one, one issue. The other issue is uh, that the judge is not only is, is basically saying uh, that Argentina cannot pay any of the exchange bonds. In, in other words, when I said, when I, I mentioned at the beginning that the exchange bonds were in many legislations, Argentina, um, New York, London, and Tokyo, and a few other European places. Now, the, uh, Griesa, can rule about New York legislation, bonds issues under New York legislation. Now, he's, he's also blocking payments of bonds issued under European legislation and under Japanese or Tokyo legislation. Why? Because those bond, the funds come through New York. So he orders the Bank of New York not to transfer that money. In my view, that's too much. I mean, the bonds that really are uh, really under his ruling are the, those issued under New York law. The others, some other judge should rule. Uh, but these are, again, uh, issues, technical issues. Um, one, one issue that has come up is whether there is a case for a sovereign debt restructuring mechanism. Uh, I remember back in the early 2000s, there was, were a lot of discussions uh, about whether a restructuring in the, in the, for new bonds, and that was between John Taylor and Ann Kruger. There were discussions about whether debt should be issued, the new debt should have a, was enough to have collective action clauses in order to avoid this, in order to simplify restructurings, or if, if countries should be treated like corporations, and there should be kind of a sovereign restructuring mechanism. In other words, there has to be someone, a judge, the UN, the IMF, someone in there who should decide who gets what, uh, in a, who, who has the claims, and in a way, talk about the solvency, how much they can pay, blah, 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 blah. Um, that's an issue that has come back again. In my view, that's extremely, very, it's extremely difficult to put in place for two reasons. First, who is going to be the one making the decision? 
is going to be the IMF. That's the, the devil for some people. The UN is the devil for other people. So, so I don't see who is going to be making the decision. Second, what happens is if the country doesn't want to abide by the decision, what mechanism do you have to enforce? Will you send the, the gunboats as they did in you know last century? No. So I think that I doubt that any of these stories is going to be one that it might work. Uh, perhaps it will pay a lot of papers, but I don't think it's going to work. Third question, and probably the last one, how easy is it to recover after the fault? I mean, is Argentina deemed not to get back to the financial market for 10 years, 20 years, or two years? Uh, that's a difficult question. Most people say that markets are very kind of penalize people when, or countries when they defaulted. Let me give you one example. Argentina in 2001 defaulted, Brazil didn't default it. Argentina restructured the debt in 2005, um, and Brazil obviously didn't restructure because it didn't default it. In 2007, two years after the fault. How much more was Argentina paying than Brazil? Nothing. They were paying the same. Why? Because markets are forward-looking. Markets are not in the business of penalizing countries, they are in the business of making money. If they see an opportunity, they grab it. Maybe rating agencies are in that business, maybe the IMF or some other institution is in that business. But markets are, are basically forward-looking. If they see that there's been a change and that the change is for real, it's not going to take a year or two, but it's over three, four years, Argentina would be back in the market, would be kind of a normal country. Um, so I think that this issue of the, kind of the, of the market access could be faster than than we, we saw. Are there, finally, and this is, yes, this is the last one. Are there any lessons from Argentina's default restructuring new default? I, I try to go through, through many of them. Um, perhaps, I'm not sure how many, maybe in the Q&A we can get a few more. One uh, is the issue that, you know, maybe Argentina made a number of mistakes in, in the process. The first one is just being too greedy in the initial offer. I think you know it would have been much better to really get out of the way this issue. Uh, maybe be more generous because in the end that would have, would have paid off a lot because today Argentina would have a problem and would be getting money and would be growing and would be kind of a, a country uh, in much better shape. How much more would have taken? Probably not much to get much bigger figures uh, in terms of acceptance of the offer. So I think that there was a mistake there. Second, there was a mistake on the RUFO. There could have been a RUFO, but no one asked for, for 10 years. I mean, 10 years is too much. Maybe you give five years, four years, something that people feel you're not, not going to sign something, and tomorrow you do something different. Uh, um, I'm not sure what other lessons I, I can quickly get. The other thing is you, you, do, you do in uh, mistreat the judge. That wasn't a good idea uh, to talk publicly against him um, because that really, he, 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 he basically has the last word and has, you have to be careful there. Um, the other thing is that in spite of all what we say, and, and there's something about the um, the vulture fight, the, the, the ruling about the vultures that probably make most Argentines uncomfortable. Because although they had a right, although they're, it seems that they're getting too much, in a sense they're getting much more than other creditors. Um, that's something that probably, because they had some special bonds, I think that that creates some uneasiness in Argentina about settling with them. And that's what gets some uh, popular support for the tough attitude toward the, the vultures. But in the end, I think that Argentina will have to settle. And it's a matter of price. 
In the end, it's not this government, the next government, uh, because, you know, Argentina is not a country that can live forever in default. So, basically, I stop here and take questions. Uh, yes, <clears throat> Miguel, I was, since uh, the issue with the president seems to be a matter of face, right? I was thinking, uh, why can't there be a solution along the following lines? Some third party, right? Some unspecified third party pays off the vultures, right? Under the table, quietly, whatever, right? And then Argentina pays off the third party. Right, at some, yeah. some, some, some premium to, for taking the trouble. And isn't everything okay? Because the, the way it is is kind of ridiculous, right? You have this tremendous loss of you know, GDP and you know, all kinds of things because of a relatively small amount over which the argument is that these people are immoral and they should not be rewarded for their immorality, right? Which is in, in economics and finance is kind of a little, <laughs> little too much. Right? So why, why can't we have that kind of... Actually, no, that's a good question, Ron. In fact, there was such an agreement at, some, at one point. Um, just put this. Uh, on June, you know, Argentina had to pay, make the payment on June 30. After that, there was a grace period of 30 days before actually entering default. And that day was July 30. So if Argentina by July 30 paid, reached an agreement with the holdouts, the whole issue would go away. There were a number of bankers uh, sponsored apparently by what the chief of cabinet and the president of the central bank at the time, who was Fabrega, who came to New York, sat with the holdouts, reached an agreement. They were going to pay 80% of the, of the amount, uh, and eventually, um, they would pay now, uh, some technical issues, they would put a stay so Argentina could keep paying, and once the roof expired, they will, they will close the deal. The deal was closed. The president at the time was in Venezuela, but he sent the Minister of Finance from Venezuela to New York. Everything indicated that that was closing the deal. He went into the press conference at 6.20. He entered the conference with a thumbs up. You have thought, done deal? No. Basically, he started bashing the holdouts, saying they were not, he was not going to pay more, and that was it. I think it was an issue of personalities, egos, who was going to, to get the credit for arranging the thing. But I think now they're coming back to this idea of, of trying to get someone who had not be the Argentine bankers because it has to be Soros or some nice guys like that. The amount is a fraction of the wealth of single individuals all over the world, right? But someone, yes, but someone has... Yeah, that's what I meant by window dressing. Someone has to come and pay. And probably... I mean, with all these long, complicated things, you don't need to just, you know, pay it. And then... The problem is that we economists. It's not the money that Argentina doesn't want to pay. No. It's the who do you pay the yeah. money to? Right. You pay it to some nice guy. And then they don't pay the budget. And Gavin is offering me. <laughs> he can't. Uh, no, I have, I have a technicality uh, related to that, very short. I mean, my question is I mean, it's so on the face of it, so irrational yeah, exactly. that it's hard to believe. Now, coming from Argentina, you can believe it. <laughs> but leaving that aside, uh, uh, I thought that maybe by bypassing the procedure that way, uh, a very clever lawyer here say, well, I see what's happening. They are the, the vultures that got paid full, in full. So that's a reduced form. So, so the lawyer comes up and says, I will now sue because you really are cheating us. It's one way to cheat us. Uh, I, I thought that maybe that would uh, introduce some rationality to, to the government's reaction. Did that, was that being discussed at all, that that might uh, trigger? 
more uh, judicial action. Yeah, I think that they're concerned about the RUFO. The fact that they, I mean, the government can settle. The issue is they, they, they were concerned about a settlement before January 1st. I think that, in my view, I talked to a number of lawyers and asked them, does RUFO apply if you pay a judicial order? And time and again, they said no. RUFO is for voluntary offers. Okay? But, as you said, lawyers are going to sue. Their business is to make money suing, so they will always find an, a reason to sue. And uh, that will go on for a while. The thing is that the probability of, of winning for them is very, very, very small in that case. Okay, we, I will open up for Q&A uh, for everybody, of course. Uh, but I want to make sure that you ask short questions because this is very rich and I'm sure that there's going to be a lot of questions. So please uh, refrain from making big statements uh, at this point. Uh, when we finish, you can grab him and t take him wherever you wish and take all the juice out of him. But for, for us to take benefit of the discussion, let's keep the questions uh, very short. Uh, Christine, what this? Hello, I'm a PEMBA student. You mentioned about uh, the several times of debt default in Argentina, but this year's debt default didn't have too much effect to international capital market and didn't uh, affect uh, some international investors, especially Chinese investors. As you know, China has also signed many investment contract and agreement in Argentina this year since Chinese president visited Argentina. And this investment, especially in ag infrastructure, agriculture, and uh, finance. And this uh, investment also favorable to the Argentina economic growth. And the Chinese Central Bank has, uh, has also signed the currency swap agreement with Argentina Central Bank. And uh, my question is that, does the Argentina government have any preferential policies to foreign investors, especially at this period of time, and this investment uh, are favorable to Argentina economic growth and economic structure? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, it's true that the president of, Ar the, of, of uh, China and Argentina got together. Uh, and they signed some agreements on um, on, on investments, and, and there's also a currency swap for around $10 billion. Okay? Now, the money, you know, on FDI comes very slowly. Okay? The, the, the Chinese rating agency put Argentina in default. Not only S&P and Moody's, but also the Chinese rating agency. And the Argentines have to go running to China to explain that they were not in default and they want to keep the money coming back again. And then Argentina went to for this $10 billion from the swap. And we didn't get $10 billion. Um, basically, they said, that's money for trade. We can get some money. But in this first stage, we'll give you $700 million will go in stages. You know, Chinese, are, from what I understand, they're very wise people. So they go, in, they go slowly. They go, but they go slowly. And they're coming, yes. But you know, the, the, amount, the, the amount of money that comes from China is not enough to reverse the situation. Probably Argentina would need 15 or $20 billion. And so far, it comes, you know, it's not coming in that amount. There are uh, very interesting opportunities in in hydroelectric power, where the Chinese are investing. There are opportunities in, I think, in, tra in trains and transportation, some infrastructure projects. And in oil, uh, we have shale gas explorations. They're coming. But these things, you know, they don't move at the speed that Argentina would need now. Who else would come? At what point? At some point, our main trading, our main friend in the financial market was Venezuela. But they don't have a penny now. Uh, so we went to Russia, but Russia is concerned about Ukraine. Brazil doesn't want to give us money. So we don't have many friends, unfortunately. Um, and in part, that's because Argentina has been not been very wise in terms of external relationships. I mean, really, it didn't nurture. Uh, it just sided too much with Chavez, and, and that, that generated lots of problems. 
Um, so imagine that your your scenario is right that you know by January first when they can pay they look for like a, a saving face with like Soros or someone and so they would pay it's not that much money I think that's likely to happen. What will happen with the rest of the economy? I mean, would that really make the economy go well, or after that it would still be in bad shape? I mean, there are no magic solutions. You know, the economy takes a long time to get in a recession and takes time to get out of a recession. I think that if once there is an, an agreement and the kind of the, the phantom of the default goes away, the concerns about the default go away, then you're going to see a big rally in Argentine asset prices, which is the first thing that you see. Stocks, bonds go up. The cost of Argentina's credit go down. You're going to get, regain access to the capital markets. The issue of reserves is going to start to, to recede, and then the economy is going to pick up. Now, you're not going to get 7% growth next year. I mean, the, well, as soon as the growth starts going up, the, the economy is going October, to. You're fine. <laughs> yeah, but you know, it depends. It's October 26. But you come from the from a very low level. <laughs> yep. So that's why I think that's the incentive for them to to reach an agreement. I know. Uh, but Argentine assets have actually uh, been on a tear. I mean, and. Unlike uh, what you could imagine, uh, Argentine stocks were up 80% this year. Um, you know, default or no default. So to think that they, if the default would go away, that then suddenly they would go up another 80 or 100, maybe it's already discounted. The question I have is everybody that you read here say that from Argentina or from anywhere looking at Argentina say, next year elections, Everybody is going to be better, no matter what, who gets elected. So, and therefore, everybody's looking to October 2015 and beyond for a better time. Do you feel that that's warranted? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Let me explain you why. <laughs> um, let me see who are the candidates and and what, what are they likely to do? First of all, I think that the big issue, the big problem with Argentina at the moment, the big constraint that we have is on the external front, okay? The problem is the ex external front, is international reserves, is the exchange rate. I mean, there are lots of problems in Argentina, but those are the, in my view, the, the most pressing ones. Who are the candidates? Well, the one candidate is Massa. Which, who is a Peronist? Everyone is Peronist, almost everyone. Okay? You have Massa, who comes, who, who worked for Cristina. He was chief cabinet, uh, chief of cabinet with, with Cristina in, in her first mandate. Not with Nestor, but with Cristina. He's a Peronist, but he's presenting himself as opposition. Um, what's the th first thing that he did when he decided to be, to be candidate? came to New York and talked to all the bankers. He talks to investors and he, so I think in a way he would mean a big change, at least in this front. In other things, it's more difficult. Second candidate is Scioli. Scioli is the governor of the president, uh, province of Buenos Aires. He's very, he, he's supposedly running on Cristina's party. What's the first thing that he did? He came to New York. He talked to investors. Um, and he's much more moderate than Cristina. In fact, she's, he's very uncomfortable with Cristina. He's just in, in her party because he wants her votes, right? So he, with, his vote, with her votes, he can win. Without her votes, he cannot win. So he's kind of running, trying to, to kind of very thin line of being with her and without her. The third candidate is Macri. Macri is clearly different. It's much more. It's a different party. He is much uh, market oriented. Um, now, all these three candidates will do a few things. All of them will have a unify the foreign exchange market relatively quickly. Will eliminate the foreign exchange controls. Will find a way to solve the with window dressing or some other way the um, the, um, the the issue of the holdouts. Um, they will have honest statistics because we still don't have 
reliable statistics in Argentina today. Uh, and with that, I would say the bulk of the macroeconomic, of these ex macro external problems will be solved. I mean, we'll, we'll move away from what I mentioned, the two gap model, to a more traditional economy as we have today. The issue of reserves is not going to be an issue. Um, now, then the differences are going to be more how much import substitution strategy, how much industrial policy, how much government intervention. There they differ more. Uh, probably Scioli would be more interventionist, Macri would be much more free market. But you know, in terms of the big macro issues, which is what really affecting Argentina's growth and the debt today, the outcomes are going, I mean, are going to be very similar if you look at who the advisors are, um, are very similar. So in that sense, uh, there's a lot of chance, uh, there is a lot of hope to be optimistic. <coughs> at least in these areas. Then, when you get to inflation, energy, that's going to take a lot. I think you, you were, yeah. Um, Miguel, maybe you can share more too. What do you think would be the, the impact of changing the place of paying the bonds now from New York to Buenos Aires and changing the ancient of that too? So what's going to be the impact of that? Or yeah, what's can... going to be the effect, if any, into Argentinian finance and standing in the world, changing Bonnie for Banco Nacion and all those things he did right now? I mean, did, I mean for first of all, um, when one of the things Argentina did in this process is said, OK, we, we want to pay. The judge doesn't allow us to pay. Bank of New York doesn't want to pay. So come and get the money in Argentina. So they put a new trustee, which is uh, Banco Nacion, or subsidiary of Banco Nacion, to make the payments. <coughs> so um, is it going to work? No, it's not going to work. Has anyone gone there? No, nobody has gone there. Are US investors going to go there? No, they're not going to go there. In some cases, because they say they are, then their fiduciary responsibility doesn't allow them. In other cases, because they think that um, um, because uh, they think they would be in violation of, of Grisas orders. In other cases, because they prefer to have a bad, a, a non-performing bond under New York law than a performing bond under Argentina's law. Okay? So I think it's not going to work. Why did Argentina do it? Mainly, uh, the main reason is Argentina says, I want to pay, and I am paying. Uh, if it pays into Bank of New York, gives the money to Bank of New York, there's some risk that Judge Grisa could say, they'll bring the money to the U.S. If they pay into a, a fiduciary of Banco Nacion, Grisa might say whatever he wants and no one cares. So, yeah, but the global standing, maybe, and the prospect of next debt, uh, global standing in the market, not, not the after effect. I think they will revert all the laws and go to the original things. So they're going to the new law to Congress to change the previous law. And that's the only thing they can do. Yes. Um, you've placed a um, big emphasis on international reserves as a, a key factor for the external imbalance. Um, is it possible that um, the fact that they're using reserves might be hindering, might actually be be the problem? That it seems to me that the, this spread between um, what the official exchange rate is and the unofficial um, is being exacerbated by the central bank intervening in the market to try and keep the um, currency from depreciating. Like, is it is it, is it possible that um, if the central bank stopped intervening or stopped using reserves, um, that spread between the different exchange rates would grow. Would, would, well, would if they stopped intervening, that would sort of converge, and that would help international trade. Like, would, the would problem, yeah. no, the problem at the moment is that I mean, why is is, is the the exchange where it, where it is uh, the the parallel rate? Um, one of the reasons is there are too many pesos, and no one wants pesos. So if you get a peso, you go and buy dollars. That puts pressure or goods. So that's what keeps inflation high and what keeps uh, the parallel exchange rate high, too, uh, and, and, and the spread too large. The central bank, in fact, is selling very few dollars. 
Uh, if you want to import, it's very difficult because the central bank doesn't sell you the dollars. Um, to make things worse, in the last three, four months, uh, you know, there are two processes if you want to import. There's the first process that you have to request the Ministry of Commerce authorization to import. Once you go to get this authorization, you get the, the goods in, then you go to the central bank and say, okay, now I want to pay abroad. The problems are in both sides. Okay? First, you can get the goods in, but then you have a problem of paying them for them. The central bank, because they have this shortage of reserves, is not allowing payment. So there are, there's, according to some estimates, there are roughly $5 billion of imports that already came to Argentina who haven't been paid. So that adds, that, that's debt. And what the problem is that once you have that, at some point, corporations said, I'm not going to import anymore. I, I don't care if I get the permission from the Ministry of Finance. If I cannot pay, I, I, I have a, my, my ex, the, the guy who gives me the supplier doesn't give me the credit. And I won't be able to import. Even if, I, if it, and the intercompanies are not giving enough credit either. So it's a mess. So what I'm saying is the, it's not an issue in intervention. Really, if you want to solve this issue, I think I have to do it two-prone strategy. First, flexible, you need to de devalue, raise interest rates to levels that the peso deposits becomes attractive. And third, you need some inflows of dollars to generate confidence so that people are not concerned about uh, going to the black market to buy. Okay. Yeah, no, since there are no, no questions uh, on Argentina, it seems you have <laughs> really everything is clear. It's a basket case. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but since we have just a, a few minutes on, on the global implications of all of this, and you have shown that uh, in the short run, doesn't seem to be uh, much going on. We have some talking heads here in the in the U.S., especially from academia, claim that that's going to be a uh, very serious, uh, severe impact for for emerging markets in particular. And that I'm personally more concerned about uh, the U.S. increasing interest rates or China going into big trouble, right? Uh, now, uh, but leaving that aside, uh, uh, the fact that, uh, that one, one of the, as you mentioned, one of the important questions that is out there, and I, I don't think we have a satisfactory answer yet, is why uh, somebody lends to a sovereign, even when the empirical evidence, as you noted, uh, indicates that many countries have been able to go back to the capital market after that. And in that context, then you may wonder if that continues in the future, emerging market may have trouble getting foreign funding. And for Latin America in particular, which is a low savings region, that could be quite serious for the prospect of, of future growth. So in that context, uh, having a judge doing crazy things and being very tough, increasing the cost of default, couldn't that increase the credibility in the future of uh, emerging markets and therefore facilitate the flow of funds to emerging markets and in particular in Latin America help growth? going forward. Oh, that's a very good point. I see that you haven't changed since you were my advisor. <laughs> um, no, I think you have a good point. One of the, the issues that the Argentine default generated at the beginning, especially 2005, 2006, was the asymmetry of power between debtors and creditors when you're dealing with a sovereign default. Because, you know, any sustainability analysis at that point probably, sustainability analysis probably could have indicated that Argentina could have paid more 
in, two, in, in the 2005 offer. Uh, and creditors basically had no leverage or no way to negotiate. It was, very, it was basically what you said. I mean, once you lend to a sovereign, you are basically a lot in, their, in, in, in its hands. Um, I think that I, I was amazed by that. Uh, I was amazed by the small capacity that creditors had to negotiate. Uh, they could say, I'm a holdout. And that's what some of them did. And then the second time around, that num the number of holdouts was even smaller. And you're right, the only way that I think that, but the interesting thing is that most countries pay anyway. I mean, the, what we see in Argentina is the exception rather than the rule. Uh, in spite of these asymmetric powers that, that, that probably borrowers have in the case of sovereigners, they still uh, they still pay most of the time. So it's, reputation effect, right? it's a reputation effect, which in the case of Argentina, is at the beginning, if you look at 2007, wasn't that important because Argentina was able to go back to, to reasonable ex rates. But still, uh, there must be a reputational effect of the, uh, that, that explains the issue. But, you know, and, and you, you might have a point. I, I think that in the case of Greece, I think has gone uh, Maybe he would have been tougher earlier and not uh, in a way of being extreme as he's now. I think that what he's doing is overreacting. In, in, it's still an interpretation of the law. Uh, I was surprised that the, 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 when they went to the appeals court, the New York Courts of Appeal, they basically sided with, with the judge. Um, maybe Argentina didn't do a good lobby exercise. I don't know. There were a number of things. Uh, but, but that, that, that's, that's a reality. Uh, obviously, the fact that Nicaragua didn't get away with murder, that Peru had to pay and all the others had to pay, obviously may, reduces the, the incentive for the fault. But also, the collective action clauses, I think, now kind of have changed the way the, the rules, the laws under which the financial markets operate. Thank you. Well, wonderful presentation. Thank you very much.